Peter Purich is an inspiring and creative violin maker known for his unique personalized chinrest design. He's also a multi-instrumentalist who performs in many different styles and a dedicated violin and viola pedagogue. Because this conversation was extra long, it has been divided into two episodes. Part one delves into his development as a luthier and a creative musician. He shows and describes some of his innovations with chinrest design. The episode ends with him playing some improvisations and also some fantastic parenting advice. Part two will continue with a lot of specifics about playing and teaching the violin, some of his innovative instrument designs, his unique shoulder support, and some great wisdom. I've added timestamps in the description, and like all these episodes, this is available both as a podcast and a video. The link is in the description, and the transcript will be published to the same link. Hi, Peter Purich. Thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for inviting me. I met you, I think it was about 22 years ago when you made a chin rest for me. Sounds about right, yeah. And I'm so happy with it. It's just been wonderful. Great. Satisfied yeah. customer. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> You're such an interesting musician. You do so many projects, but you are very well known as a chin rest specialist. I think we'll be talking about that quite a bit today. I'm curious to know, it seems like um, music runs so strongly in your family and you actually learned the art of violin making from your dad, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Uh, he was, he was an, I could say, an amateur maker, although he made a fair number of instruments, but he was, most of his career, he was a physics teacher. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, but, but he was a, a very amateur violinist as well, so he was like, let's say, my first teacher, mm -hmm. you know, but he wasn't, he wasn't exceptionally good. I mean, he started learning um, when he was a teenager and maybe a, a little bit late for what we think um, and he had to it was in the, the former Yugoslavia and he had to um, get money to for the lessons and the war started and then everything just went to to uh, hell in a handbasket as they say mm. so uh, the war really messed things up and after the war the communists moved in and so his uh, violin career was never really took off the ground but he um, he ended up you know uh, going to university and other in other fields and languages and sciences and stuff and when they came to Canada uh, you know he was working uh, uh, with uh, Marconi uh, the electronics firm and uh, eventually he became uh, a mathematics and pre uh, physics teacher at a high school and head of department of science and until he retired but when he was doing that he was also was interested in music and the violin and in the 60s there was a Scientific American magazine that came out uh, on the cover was a was a violin showing interesting patterns of, of grains on it and it was an article about Carlene Hutchins who was at that point one of the premier uh, researchers on acoustics of violins and it was an article about her and the acoustics of uh, string instruments and and the work that she was doing so he was obviously fascinated because it just it brought together all these fields that he was interested in it and he said well yeah I'm gonna make a violin and knowing nothing about it mm -hmm. and so he got a book of course uh, getting a book was a, a big thing in our house it was always like you have a question go get a book you know, so, so that was it go look go look it up that was the that was the response um, yeah so he started making and then uh, uh, you know it's if you in those days there was no internet so it was hard to get information but he uh, started making, and I was just hanging around the the apprentice, you know. So I'd be helping him hold stuff and gluing and everything. And I I watched him for many many years, and uh, eventually I, I was I've seen done so many times. I sort of I knew how to do it already without having had it done. And so I actually started making bows okay. before I made violins. I was um, I was National Youth Orchestra back in '77, I think it was, and um, Maurice Clark from London came over, and uh, he had brought a bunch of Baroque bows and transitional bows and he gave a talk about them and we got to use them in the little Baroque orchestra that we had at the National Youth Orchestra at the time and I was fascinated with the ideas because it was the first time I'd seen them up close I'd just seen bad sketches in books and stuff like that but uh, to actually hold them and then to play them to see what the difference is and to see the whole idea of different articulations and the stuff you can get just blew my mind so I, uh, I borrowed the bows from him and I, I, I did very precise measurements of them and he was very nice and and I did these drawings and everything I took them back home and then um, I hadn't I didn't have any bow with though but I, I looked up some back of some magazines I saw this guy down in Florida had some Pernambuco so my dad was going down to Florida to visit a buddy of his and I said here look this guy up and and get me some some wood you know 
and he came back with a whole stack of Pernambuco, uh, and he was going to be making bows too now because he got inspired by this guy down there. So I started making some Baroque bows with using Pernambuco, which is not actually the official uh, wood for Baroque bows. But uh, hey, uh, if you go to museums in Europe anywhere and look at look at instruments and bows from the time, one thing you, you really notice is that the materials and the shapes of instruments and bows varied mm-hmm. quite a bit. So you can you can imagine that 400 years ago, not everybody had everything available to them. You couldn't just order it online or something like that, and who knows what the trees, local trees you had. So you basically made instruments with what you had at hand. And some of the bows were really crude, you know, and just made of regular twigs and stuff like that, practically. So it didn't bother me that I didn't have the official, you know, wood, snake wood or something like that. I was going to get hold of that later. But I made some bows, and uh, they turned out to be pretty good. So I learned a, a few things uh, right there. And it was only when I was I was planning to, after I graduated in 82, I, I decided, hey, I'm going to go to Europe for a few months and hang around. I said, hey, it might be interesting to have a violin with me, but I didn't want to take anything really valuable. And so I thought, well, uh, hey, I'll make one. So I, uh, I, got, some, I got some cheap wood um, around, and uh, since I knew how to do it, I, uh, I just slammed it together, and, uh, and it worked. It turned out to be pretty good. Were you busking so, uh, in Europe? Or? Well, so the idea was I was going to make a, a small case for the violin, so for portability, they didn't have those fancy band cases in those days. It was like a big, heavy case. But I said, no, no, I got to make a small case, and uh, and I also I made a small bow. So the, the length of a violin is about twenty-three mm-hmm. inches. The bow is about twenty-eight inches. You know, so I said, I'm going to make a small. I'm going to make a bow the same length as the uh, as the violin. But also, what I did was I, I said, but it's going to have the weight of a full-size bow. You know, so it had a special curve to it. So when you play it, it feels like a, a full-size bow. It has the weight, so you can do a lot of stuff. It's just that it's shorter. You just have to be careful when you get to the, to the tip. It's just it's like a lot sooner. You can jab your your bow into the into the strings. But uh, so I had that. I made that bow and I made the violin. I was all set. I just needed a case, and it was during the summer. And uh, I was working with fiberglass, and it was very hot, and and uh, that's not a good combination. And so as I was, I had the mold all set out and, and I was laying the fiberglass and, and it was just seizing before it, it just cured before mm-hmm. I could even mold it. And I got very frustrated and I just threw the thing in the corner. I said, I'm not taking a violin a year. <laughs> so, so that's it. And probably a good idea. I was thinking of playing there. I didn't, I didn't, didn't have that much opportunity anyway. I just, I visited a whole bunch of violin makers in Cremona and got to play a little bit there and, and uh, a violin maker in Vienna. I, I. I met up with so okay. it, was, it was fun did some research but uh, didn't do any playing yeah and, and since this was um, you know the early 80s how did you make contact with these people before you got there well in Cremona it's not hard you just go to their violin yeah. shop you know it's a bunch of bunch of shops um, it was it was August so a lot of them were closed unfortunately because a lot of the stuff closes down but uh, in Vienna I actually I had a friend of mine who uh, in in Montreal here in Laval, uh, an old gentleman who was originally from Vienna, Karl Balaban, a fine uh, pianist and violinist, and he was a he was an old friend of mine, and he said, "You must go to Vienna and see my friend." And his friend was a violin maker who was actually in charge of maintaining all the instruments in the um, in the Vienna Orchestra, in the Vienna Phil. So so in the Vienna Phil they have uh, uh, they give you an instrument oh. to play, yeah. And you don't have to. You can use your own if you want, but you don't have to because they provide one for you, and uh, and it's downstairs in the in the in the uh, below the pit wherever you know the and um, and you have a spot for your instrument, and it's uh, it's taken care of. If if a string breaks, you just leave it there, and the next day there's a string on it. You know you can order which string you want. It's like the, the bows are rehaired written regularly. It's amazing. So uh, it's that's service. I tell you, <laughs> uh, and I went to see this actually because. Uh, 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 my neighbor across the street, his old buddy used to play in the Montreal Symphony and eventually went to play in Vienna. So uh, I had that phone number. So I called him up and I met him just before they were playing a version, uh, a concert of Tannhauser or something like that. He said, hey, meet me uh, backstage type of thing. So I, I got to go to ba- backstage at the Vienna Opera and talk to um, Eddie Kudlak and, uh, and he sh- took me downstairs and I saw all these instruments and stuff like that and uh, we had a great chat. So that, and then I, I, I went to see the, uh, the violin maker was at this point he was retired but we had a great chat he showed me some instant projects that he had going on so that was yeah cool 
that's how uh, that's how you do it. Did, did you know German, or did he have enough English? Uh, no, I, I my my cousin spoke German, uh, so uh, she sort of interpreted. So that, that was fine. And um, with Eddie, well, he spoke English, yeah. so it was not a problem. Yeah. I was just interested when you mentioned the um, the wood of the bow because I did play baroque violin for many years, and I have a baroque and transitional bow. And what I found interesting when I was learning about that is that they hadn't discovered Pernambuco yet. So that that's why those bows don't have the same bounce. What's special about Pernambuco, which is now a rare wood because of the destruction of the Amazon, is that it has this amazing bounce, which some people may not realize that's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's a, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's has, yeah, elas elasticity, mm. let's say, you know, it, uh, and, um, and a combination of, it's always a combination of things. So it's a combination of the elasticity and the mass. Uh, that's that's uh, that's important, but you know, so the um, let's say iron wood or or snake wood that you use in a baroque bow that can be used um, for a modern bow mm -hmm. as well. In fact, some of the let's say the the dod bows and stuff like that. I tried a few dod bows, which are, the wood is so dark you can't really tell what it is anyway. And I you'd say this is not Pernambuco; mm -hmm. it's it's something else, and a, a terrific sound, absolutely marvelous sound. So. It, they might not give you the spiccato that you want, you know, but the tonal qualities are really there because, yeah, if you have too much spring in the bow and if it's too light, then then you're going to get a light springy bow, which will probably emphasize more of the higher frequencies, but you'll get a really really crisp uh, spiccato out of it. I I have I think all violins should have a collection mm -hmm. of bows, and so I remember I was once playing a, a piece. Uh, that uh, had a lot of really spiky sounds. It was a 20th century piece, a lot of spiky sounds. And so I took this light bow that I had, very stiff, and it was, it just worked fine, you know. I wouldn't take it for Brahms, yeah. you know, because that you need is a, a much more buttery type of sound. It's, it's going to just sink in and give you that thickness and, and warmth, you know. Uh, so for that, you take another bow. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm, I'm, a big proponent of you know having a collection of bows, this selection mm -hmm. of tools. You're not gonna you're not gonna find uh, the one bow that does it all for everything, yeah. you know. So uh, just go ahead and, and get. I mean, I spend most of my time these days with a carbon fiber bow, you know. And even they are this is a variety of them, but uh, they're if you break them, it's it's not a loss, you know. So um, when I was playing a lot of Jewish weddings, and so right you know right they they. At the, right at the chupa, we're at the chupa, and they, they break the glass, and then they then they start going out, and so I'd go with the accordion player, you know, tra -dun -da -dun -da 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 and go, out, but the, the crowds just get in yeah. on you, you know, and you're like playing like this, and and they don't care about you, you know, it's so like you could get so I was I just I take a cheap instrument, you know, and and uh, and my carbon fiber bow because if it breaks, well, okay, it's a, it's not a not a big loss, you know, or if I play a, you know a. a, a a show, you know, you put your put your bow on the stand, and the technician walks by, and boom, you know. So it's it's um, it's not worth it sometimes to take your nice yeah. equipment, you know. So I have I have a couple of reasonable wooden bows, nothing fabulous, but if I'm playing Bach solo, yeah, I'll take them. Yeah, you know, I'll take a. And wooden you've bow. done some materials research in terms of um, like being a luthier with with you've worked with engineers, I believe, at McGill. You did some projects. Yeah, the 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 the, the work at McGill was. Uh, carbon fiber, uh, working with carbon fiber. So they had a series of projects with students and they, they wanted to make an instrument um, out of carbon fiber because this was the, uh, the, the materials lab. And uh, so, I mean, it wasn't a unique idea. Carbon fiber instruments have been done already. But um, and I've, I've tried them and um, they're fine. I, I just they, I found they had limitations to them, so I, I wouldn't use one myself. And I noticed that a violin was not as good as the viola was not as good as a cello. You know, this way, you know, when I tried those three instruments in that range, I was much more satisfied with the cello sound than the viola sound than the violin sound. It was, so it was, it was a strange sort of size thing going there. So that was that was an interesting thing to me. And then so then they, they wanted to make these these plates and I said well there's different ways you can do it and so we we uh, settled in on um, I, I'm not sure if it was in collaboration with another uh, area of the um, McGill research but they wanted to check out the acoustics of the plates as well and so 
uh, I said, yeah, we can do that, but let's let's not make the whole instrument. Let's just mm -hmm. make the top plate where a lot of the characteristics of the sound, the instrument come from. And so what I did was I got a couple of uh, cheap Chinese instruments, and I I I I made sure they were about the same size and everything. They're from the same manufacturer, and then I removed the top plates, and I said, okay, I gave them the, the outline mold and said, this is this is our shape. Okay, we are going to now make carbon fiber plates that are going to replace the wooden ones, and uh, and so they started doing that, and they they would give me the plate, and I, well, it was rough. So like in, in a press, so I had to cut away all the rest of the stuff. I had to cut the f holes and and fix it up. Now I put it on the on the wooden body. I'd string it up and I'd play it, and I'd I'd analyze it and I'd I'd come up with uh, uh, comments. Let's say you know it's, it's too loud. It's not loud enough. This is down. It's not, let's let's do something different. Let's do a different layup. So we started to do different layers because the fibers is, is it's like mm -hmm. a weave. You can have all in one direction. You can have two directions, or you can have more in one direction, less, or you can cut it in different shapes. So you can alter the uh, the layups. I think when they make uh, the commercial uh, instruments, they don't really worry about that. They just take like a one cloth mm -hmm. and put it down and press it in and that's it. And so yeah, we we did that too and and I found limitations with the the acoustic qualities of that. So I said, "Okay, let's let's change it up a bit. Let's uh put different patterns." So they did that. And then I would I would check out the the acoustics of it and I'd assemble it and I I play it and say, "Okay, this is good." And so they give me stacks of plates with different weaves and I just keep replacing them all the time and uh, coming up with comments and then I, I discovered that um, what is really the interesting thing was that the if I leaned in one direction the instrument these plates started sounding more interesting but it didn't lack volume the other way it got loud but it was kind of boring so I was always looking for interest to me even a, a wooden instrument I'm always looking for interest you know the instrument might respond well it might have a big sound clear and stuff like that but Somehow, if it's not interesting, it's not, you know, I always equated to looking at a fireplace. You can sit for hours staring at a fire, you know, but you put a picture of a fire there, you're done after a few seconds. It's just not doing anything, right? So to me, sometimes I pick up a violin and it's, it's just like that picture. It's all there, but it's not, I'm, I'm not attracted to it, you know, or I take a violin and suddenly, you know, I start playing it and... And I like to improvise, and I'm just playing stuff, and and it, it it feeds back into me, and I can do different things, and suddenly it's like an hour's gone by. Okay, this is the one, you know. It interests me. It 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 piques my curiosity somehow. There's always something that I can listen to. So with the carbon fiber plates, they were very boring at first, you know. Then I said, okay, let's introduce some complexity. So then I would say, okay, in the weave here, just take a piece of string and wrap it around like this, and and then there, and let's just set up some irregularities because the, the mm. uniformity of the material was just too uniform. So they, once irregularities started showing up in the thing, the whole thing started being more interesting. So that was, that was fascinating. And then, yeah, then uh, another project with the, uh, with the lab was to uh, make uh, accessories like tailpieces. I, I have a special design tailpiece, which I can show you, um, and chin rests, which is, it, it turned out to be nice. I'll, I'll show you that as well, but it's not as practical for my um, for my purposes because I make custom H so everyone has to be different. But if you're putting stuff in a mold, mm -hmm. it's not it's not going to be different. And uh, oh, and uh, I came up with a special design shoulder shoulder pad, which uh, needed to have a, a shell like structure, which was very stiff but very very light. And uh, that's that's very good too. It's still in development, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, a lot of fun with the materials. I always liked working with a lot of different materials. I mean, even on the instrument too. You know, if I have a chance to try something new, yeah, I'll go go for it. You know, why not? Okay, well, should we dive into chin rest then? Sure. This is your your big area of expertise. So, um, not everyone will see what you're going to show us, but for those of us watching, if you could show, you know. Pull yeah. out what you have there. Well, I mean, um, so let me have a little background. Why do I make chin rests? You can buy them in the store, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's um, because um, it, they're not everybody's comfortable. Okay, and so uh, years ago, I was, I was, uh, I started out. Uh, I, I was playing violin, and then I was going to play viola at the conservatoire, and um, so I had a viola. And uh, my dad had found one somewhere and restored it, but it didn't have a chin rest, you know, on it. So I said, wow, I'll make a chin rest. So um, I said, and you know what? I'm going to make it molded to my chin. 
Okay, so I took a mold of my chin in some some clay, some plasticine, and then I had the mold, and then I started carving out the chin rest, and it's the perfect mold to my jaw. And I said, yeah, yeah, that fits, that fits. Yeah, okay, good, good. Finished it, varnished, blah, blah, blah. put it on. Started playing. Said, that ah, this is great, this is great. And but then I realized, as soon as I turned my head a little bit, well, it was no longer fitting, right? So I couldn't turn my head. Well, okay, I suffered with that for a while. Um, but it really wasn't that good, you know? So that started me thinking, okay, it's a mold is, seems like a good idea, but it's not good for the rest of the body, you know? So then I had to, then I started making another one, which was less defined, okay? But then I started thinking, so what's the purpose of the chin rest as well? You know, so that got me started. And, uh, and then eventually I, I, I made one for myself, which is, looked like a standard Guarneri style chin rest more or less and and I played with that and uh, I, I'd started playing with a shoulder pad like like a sponge or something like that and that's what I was always using but uh, when I got to university my teacher said no no you should uh, get uh, a coon okay so I got a coon but I didn't find it that comfortable and I kept I started modifying it as well because that's what I do I would modify everything and uh, so I kept changing that around and so I was exploring different things for myself personally and I wasn't in in pain but I was in discomfort it just was not I just didn't feel right about it I liked the sponge you know but um, the teacher didn't want the sponge and so um, then I had a friend who had a, a very nice Italian violin but with a little plastic chin rest and uh, you know I said that that looks that doesn't look nice it's such a nice Italian instrument and I said I'll make you a nice chin rest out of wood you know she says yeah but I like this chin rest I'll make it exactly like the plastic one and uh, you know, so I did that and she was very happy and somebody saw that and said hey can you make me one I said yeah what kind do you want you know and then they said uh, well I don't know so let's come we'll talk about it and realized that you know she had some problems and she needed a little higher or something like that so I said okay fine I'll make you one like that and that worked out fine well then word gets out that you know I can I can make whatever you need so it turns out that chin rests which are basically an interface between your body and the instrument that's the only two two places we actually touch the we touch the instrument with our hand and then with our with our chin or collarbone that area we don't actually grab the rest of it you know so the interface between our body and something hard like that is is very similar to like our feet and our shoes interface between our body and the ground you know and uh, you know if you go to a shoe store you'll have hundreds of sh different s styles of shoes and different sizes and everything and you can go into one shoe store and not find anything comfortable and you go into another shoe store would see totally different styles and everything and you still won't find anything comfortable right so to me the chin is like shoes except that when you go into a luthery shop you have about three different models and it's just like in three different colors so it's the same shoe but with a different color so you get the ebony rosewood or boxwood you know but if you eliminate that then you bring it down to and they're all about the same saw height you know so it turns out there's like for everybody in the world like three chin rests what imagine if everybody in the world had only three choices for shoes and that's not gonna work you know so it's gonna work for some people you know and the rest of us are gonna be uncomfortable you know, and how uncomfortable? Well, depends on how badly it's fitting for us. You know, so um, yeah. Once word got out that uh, I could make people more comfortable than they were, then I started making. Then I started working more with people who actually were in, in serious pain. You know, and uh, so that got me more interested in the physiology of, of of performance, of playing, of holding, how it's holding, and the whole physics of it like why do we do what we do and, and how is and what's the purpose and so then you start to think of why do we have a chin rest anyway because the original instrument was not made with a with a chin rest of course uh, chin rest was let's say invented in about 1833 by Louis Spohr but prior to that for a couple hundred years or more uh, they didn't play with a chin rest so how do they do it so try playing without a chin rest and then you'll you'll, you'll figure out why you know and it turns out that you know, you can play without a chin rest. I mean, Baroque, historically important performance practice, they do it all the time. You know, do they do it well? Well, some of them do, some of them don't, you know? Um, and so again, there's a question of how do you do it? How do you actually play the instrument? And, and this is another interesting fact. The violin is the only instrument that you play and hold at the same time, but, I mean, we can hold a flute, whatever, uh, but that you actually 
move your hands around the, the actual support mm -hmm. of the instrument is constantly changing in the yeah. act of performing the actual instrument. You know, that's the only instrument that that happens, you know, that and the viola, the cello, you got an end pin, so, and it's you squeeze yeah. between your legs, so, you know, you, you don't have to, your hands are not obliged to hold the instrument. But the violin, the viola is the only instrument that you actually have to move your hands and round, but support the instrument at the same time. So um, that is problematic. It's problematic, not so much from the holding perspective, yes it is, but how do you actually play while moving your hand around? That's the other problem that we have. You know, how do you actually do what you're supposed to do while trying to hold something at the same time? And, and when you think of it that way, it's, it's awfully tricky. You know? So we have to learn how to do that. And so we've invented, there's a chin rest, Louis Spohr did that, and you can also imagine that, well, you know, when he invented it, like any other invention, it didn't catch on right away probably. And, you know, his model was kind of high because he was a tall guy. And if he gave it to his buddy who was short, he said, what are you doing with that probably? You know, so I don't need one of those, you know. Because in order to, uh, you know, press on the instrument, we can just press on the, well, on the left side of the tailpiece, on the right side of the tailpiece. And that's why you see all the, the, uh, the varnish is worn away on old instruments on either side of the tailpiece, you know, because that's where the chin went. And, yeah, that's, it's not, not the best thing for the instrument. Also, it dampens some of the sound, too. Never mind that if you try to put it on the tailpiece, well, that's not, that doesn't support anything at all. It's hard to hold anything on the tailpiece. And the reason why you want to put your chin on the instrument anyway is so that the instrument doesn't fly off the body. Because you can play, you can play very well without your head on the instrument, you know, as long as you stay in first position, you know. And actually, I should say, yes, you can go up in position. That's not a problem because as you're going up, your hand, the friction pushes the instrument into your neck. Mm -hmm. It's going down. That's a problem. As soon as your hand starts to move down towards the first position, then the instrument will come off your shoulder, collarbone, whatever. If you're not holding it somehow, it'll just come straight off your body, you know. And um, so that's the problem. That's when you need some sort of, I would, I'll say chin rest, but or you just need anything to hold it back there. Okay, you can have an assistant to hold it for you if you want. That'll work. Um, Got to pay them extra, but um, that's another interesting thing because that's not the there's a, there's a second time that we actually need some sort of retaining system, and that is when you vibrate. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that's that. That's the yeah. second one, and the vibrato as you know, falls into two sort of categories. One would be so-called wrist vibrato, but let's say it's just a hand vibrato because it's a, uh, you can imagine it as being a, a rod hinge going through the wrist part and coming out at the thumb. The thumb is underneath the neck and then the hand swivels back and forth through that position and the, the finger will move on the fingerboard on the string uh, lengthwise and thus changing the pitch and then you get your vibrato. The uh, other form of vibrato is where the wrist does not bend, but you have a, an arm motion, so it's at the elbow, where the elbow sort of goes wider, and the finger, tip of the finger will, will roll along the lengthways along the string, resulting in the change in pitch required. The thing is that with the arm vibrato, you're, you're pressing on the string, but at the same time, because whenever you press the string, uh, finger on the string on the top, you have to counter force it with a thumb or something on the other side. So if your arm is moving, it means not just your, your finger on top is going back and forth, but your thumb is also either rotating or sliding on the neck a bit. That is like a grip on the instrument. Whereas with the so-called wrist vibrato, the thumb rolls because it's part of the hinge system. So it just stays in place more or less and does not actually pull the neck. Okay, so all this to say is that with an arm vibrato, your instrument is gonna be want to fly off your shoulder much more readily, okay? It, it, the arm vibrato will shake your instrument more than a wrist vibrato, which is a more stationary, localized uh, form. So, but without a chin rest or some sort of restraint, both uh, vibratos are pretty bad. And um, I think that's probably one of the reasons why they didn't vibrate much in the Baroque era, because they didn't, it's not that they didn't know about it. You know, the, the singers vibrate it and, and, um, but it's just, it sounded so bad when you do it without any support. I just tried doing a vibrato without having anything holding your instrument, you know, and that, they weren't in the habit of holding their instruments all the time in the Baroque and classical eras, you know. So I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't vibrate. I mean, so Spohr, 1833, invents a chin rest, and you go up to the late 1800s, you know, and you have Marsic, and he's teaching uh, 
Chrysler. By this time, they probably have you using a chin rest, okay, and some sort of get ups. And so the instrument's more solid now in the neck. They can make a more pleasing sound vibrato. They have more control over it now, and it doesn't, the, the movement doesn't disrupt, you know. Not just that, but it's discovered that if you do vibrate, you know, your particular sound will be more recognizable in a group of uh, other violinists. Because if you're playing a concerto, let's say, and in those days the concertos were starting to get bigger and bigger, right? And the halls were slightly larger and larger. How are you going to distinguish yourself from all the other violinists right behind you? Well, if you have a particular type of vibrato, uh, I don't want to get into the physics of it here, but what happens is that your, your harmonics content of your, your note will, will change. And because the higher frequencies reflect sound, uh, are more directional, it's easier for the ear, for somebody in the audience to auditorily pinpoint who's playing that particular note mm. if they are vibrating. If they're not, there's more of a blend. It's, it's, it's like a, suddenly a fog comes in. You don't know where the sound's coming from. But as soon as the vibrato comes in, there's a, a sort of like a, a uh, honing honing in sort of system, you know, so it says, yeah, 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 there, we got it, we got it, we, we see who's playing, we can hear them, we can hear them stick out a bit more. So vibrato is one of those interesting little techniques that really helps you to uh, stick out. So if you're ever playing a concerto with a bunch of strings, you know, and you want to be heard, just tell them to stop vibrating, and, and you keep vibrating, and it'll be, you'll stick out a lot more. So yeah, so that's a technique. Uh, so yeah, and, and yeah, so you need, so you can imagine that at that point, People started using vibrato more and more up until today, you know. So vibrato is, in my opinion, a result of the chin rest, the invention of the chin rest. Yeah. So a chin rest can can look like a regular chin rest, you know. And to the to the ordinary uh, eye, it's, yeah, I've got one of those. You say, you know, and I'd say no, probably mm -hmm. not, because this is unique. It's and the next one I make might be a little bit different. And so what's, what's, what are the factors about a chin rest? Well, there's, there's going to be the uh, general height, which is from, let's say, from the instrument up to the highest point. That's what I consider the height. And then, so this one that I'm showing, for those who can't see, it's like a standard Guarneri model. Uh, it's a bit of it goes over the tailpiece, and then there's this cup that goes on the left-hand side. So in order to get a nice-fitting chin rest, okay, uh, shall I back up and talk about posture? You know, uh, Basically, I'm trying to help people who are in trouble, who are in pain or discomfort, and that's physical. So I have to find out what their problem is, and they come to me, and so we look up, did you have an accident? Are you injured? Uh, you know, is your problem caused by uh, the violin playing, or is it because you, you fell down the stairs and broke your collarbone or something? You know, so we have to figure all this out, and then they come to me, and they play, and I look at them, and if, if they're playing a certain way, something like that, and... Yeah, maybe a long neck and said, okay, well, probably a long neck, you, you'd want to have a much higher chin rest. Uh, you know, if you have a short neck, you know, then you're going to get a, a short chin rest. You know, you shouldn't, if you try to play with too high a chin rest, you know, it's like playing with really tight shoes, you know, it's not going to work. And the other way, it's, you know, if you have too low a chin rest, it's like playing with boots that are three sizes too big, you know, it's not going to work. So, uh, yeah, people come to me and uh, we, we look at that. I, I do a history, like the problems and everything, and then I listen to them play. Um, the uh, Very often, my key diagnostic tool is my ear. So while they're playing, I listen to their sound. And then during the course of the consultation, as we're trying different chin rests, I'm always very conscious of what how if the sound is changing because that's I can they can tell me oh it feels better mm -hmm. or they can say I don't know you know and but if their sound changes that tells me stuff you know so I'm always listening for the sound change sometimes you know they start playing and say ah you like that one I say yeah how do you know mm -hmm. you sound much better yeah. <laughs> and it's always sounding better because what happens is if you if you're not physically in line with or in balance with what you really want to do, uh, your sound will be like compressed, it'll be tight, it'll be, the, your timing will be off, your shifts will be out of tune. A whole lot of technical problems will just, will just be present. And they don't have to be big ones, they're just subtle things, you know. I, very often I start uh, asking people, did you want to make that shift? Did you want to do that glissando? Did you, do you really want to not vibrate on that one? And people think I'm giving them a music lesson at first. You know, because I say, okay, try it this way. 
don't make that accent, you know, and stuff like that. Because I have to find out whether the, the musical choices that they are presenting to me are deliberate ones mm -hmm. or are they part of the, their setup. You see, I can't tell. So if somebody comes and they, they might be a really fine player, you know, and this is, that's really good, you know, I just, why did you make a crescendo there when it's not one written, you know? And the, they say, I wasn't aware of it. Can you do it without, you know? And then they try without and realize that they can't or something like that. It's like, why did you stop vibrating there? You know, there's a shift coming, you know? So I have to, so I have to musically, I have to be aware of all the stuff that they're doing in order to understand where their pain is. So the one is. you made me is, is quite and, high. Uh, I can show people. Actually, one of the videos on my YouTube channel is about my setup and I, I talk about your chin rest. But yeah, anyway. Okay. It's not no. actually, yeah, well, you're not a tall person. And it's not, and it's not that tall. Uh, I mean, I have, I can show Yeah. So, so this is a, this is a standard, let's say, this is a bit, actually a little, a little taller than, than your standard chin rest. Uh, there's a very, very low. Okay. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I'll just put it up uh, here, you see. So this one's very low in comparison to, to this one, you know. But I could have, let's say, something like this. Yeah. So this would be somebody who's maybe six foot four. Yeah. So in, in comparison to, 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 to the other one. So you see, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a difference. Yeah. So, and some of them are, you know, for instance, here's, a, here's an interesting chin rest, okay? And you can see that the, the edge of it there, mm -hmm. it actually comes off, the top part comes off. So what that does is, mm -hmm. a lot of times we put our head forward, okay? But it's much better if we tuck our chin back, okay? So that our, our spine, our neck spine, because a lot of, I've had quite a few clients, quite a few, several, that have a fused fourth and fifth vertebrae, you know? And uh, from, from playing the violin, you know, because what happens is they, they jut their neck out and they press mm -hmm. down and that causes so much pressure there that their vertebrae actually gets fused, you know. So the way to release mm -hmm. that is, if you know anything about Al Alexander technique, for the violinist, as far as I'm concerned, the very first rule of Alexander technique is like the only one you need to know and that is tuck your chin in and think like there's a string, like a marionette hanging off the top of your head. If you just follow that rule from Alexander as a violinist, you're, you're going to be well on the way to curing yourself. But how do you yeah. do this when your chin rest is over there, you see? So you have to put it forward, okay, or do you? What we do is we, we take the chin rest and we, we move it back so you can put your head there, but the instrument is still further out, you see? So this, this solves that problem. Uh, sometimes there, it's a partial, mm -hmm. partial coming off, so it's just the, uh, the, the front part here, so depending on how you want it. Generally, I mean, as I say, I'm dealing with people who are injured, so uh, I'm trying to get them back into what would be a healthy sort of way of playing. So something following the Alexander posture of your head straight, your chin tucked in is fine. But if you, if you try to put that on a violin, you're, you're not going to be successful all the time. So here I am sitting straight, and I just put a violin there. And I put my chin down, there's, there's nothing here, you know, so I have to compromise. I can turn my head a little bit to the left, you know, and drop my head, you know. Turning it more and more and more is going to start being a problem, you know. So if somebody comes in yeah. with really bad neck problems and they're doing this, you know, uh, looking down at the instrument, I'm going to try to get them to, to straighten out a bit, just to save them years years from, you know, down the road from this problem. And so I try to sometimes I have to teach teach people you know that this is a different alternative way of of playing so here we go we're gonna try your head straight and if there's nothing there I'll put something there I'll, I'll bring a chin rest that comes out just to make sure that your 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 head doesn't have to go to the left you know so that's a custom custom made uh, design right off the bat you know to move it because you can't you can't buy one of those of course so that's uh, it's one of the issues uh, yeah in some cases, here's a sample of, of a chin rest, but if you look at the, uh, there's like a little bump over here, okay, which uh, uh, is, is the nature of the, what you have underneath. This particular one was made for uh, a chap with a beard, 
Okay, so some very often yeah. with a beard, you know, the, you don't get the grip that, that you want, you know. So this is more, uh, more sharply attenuated here, so yeah. that you know it would grab the hair, sort of in the beard under the jaw, you know, and able to do that. Often do I vary, I vary this section here, the bump section, depending on the distance the person's the, the side of their jaw to their to the neck. Some people have very narrow jaws, mm -hmm. you know, such as I, th I think you do in comparison to your neck. And so I think the model that you have is very similar to one that I made for my wife, uh, uh, and uh, called the Kathy model. Yeah. And uh, it has a very gentle, uh, very gentle little bump. Okay. Because there's anything bigger yeah. than that starts to gouge you under the neck. You know. So it's very important. So sometimes the edge is going to be very narrow. Sometimes it's going to be very gentle. Sometimes it's going to be very aggressive. I'll Depends actually um, I'll get my violin on uh, the show. There's, uh, people. Sh sure. And you made a nice varnish to match my fiddle as well. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's uh, it's a very similar. Yeah. I, I know. I'm very familiar with that model. Yeah. There's a, there's a chap in the uh, New York Metropolitan Opera Orchestra that plays with something very similar to that one. So, I was going to ask you because, of course, many of your clients uh, come to you in Montreal, but. How do you deal with people who live far away who can't travel? I know you have a sort of um, a method with with magnets for pro a prototype. Do you mail that to people? I've I've mm -hmm. I've had to do a few long distance mm -hmm. consultations, and I must confess they're very difficult. Very difficult uh, for several reasons. It's like yeah. Uh, again, just take the shoe analogy. I'm going to sell you shoes, you know, and I'm going to send you a. Um, a pair of shoes which I think might work and you try them on and yeah sorry they don't fit yeah. you send them back and I send you another pair you know, it's like it'll take forever you know whereas you know when you come to my studio you know you, you, you sit in front of me you play I hear you right there stereo live mm -hmm. and I say try this one and you say oh yeah. better but it gets me a little bit on the back I say ah, give it back try this one you know and boom 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 we just keep trying them until we narrow it down you know and um, so, yeah, uh, I, I feel it's very difficult. Uh, success rate is, is, is there, but mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not as, I, I just try not to do it. It's, it's too much energy. It's, it's a lot of my time. Uh, I had, like you say, with the magnets, it's not just for the people that are uh, at a distance, but uh, also for local people. So what I do sometimes is I have the chin rest mm -hmm. is divided into two sections. That would be the base and the top part and um, the top part comes off it's connected with magnets and you could slide it around and move it around as you will and so i might send a, a base plus a selection of tops which have different shapes so the person can by themselves you know try uh the different shapes um mm -hmm. that again is very time consuming and uh, not always as successful because whenever i give somebody a chin rest i want them to play right mm -hmm. away and i want them to play the same thing they just played a second ago you know because i want to hear the difference and I have to see the difference in their posture, so you know it's uh, it's not that uh, it's not that easy to do it. Uh, and it's I've tried to do a, a couple of Zoom, you know, since Zoom is more recent things. I've tried a couple of Zoom uh, uh, consultations, and uh, they're better because I can see somebody, you know. But again, I, I don't get the sound that I want. I can't. It's hard to to hear what they're doing, and if there's any little delay, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's very. Uh, upsetting so uh, sadly uh, it's most effective if people come come to see me you know so uh, but they manage I mean a lot of people manage uh, I've had people from you know Florida New York a lot of people from New York they might come to Montreal to audition for something and they hear about me and they just make an appointment mm -hmm. they come from you know LA or something like that or Ottawa Toronto they, they on, on their way through you know have you had other makers apprentice with you for this art of making custom-made chin rests? No, no. There are other makers that make custom, so-called custom-made, but it's not, it's not anywhere at the level that, that I do. The, thing, the problem is that, um, and there's, that, so there's a place in, in, I think, New Jersey, Frisch, uh, that, that they now sell, like, they will give you a, a kit of toppers and you try different sizes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that is a good step because they have different heights right off the bat. Uh, it's not always a question of height though. It's a question of shape and sometimes very subtle. There's a place in the Netherlands, uh, Violin Balance I think it's called, 
that uh, you go in and, and you, you get a consultation and, uh, and they'll make something for you. I've seen some of the results of that from some of my clients. And again, they're sort of compartmentalized, I think, too much in, in some way. Uh, what, uh, what I do is somebody comes to me, and uh, so I'm a, I'm a violinist, I'm a player, I'm a pedagogue. So I, I, I look at that part of it. I, I understand the, the physiology, uh, and uh, I've got the creative inventive mind to, to come mm -hmm. up with a possible solution, and I make it. So um, it's like one stop, everything. You have to get somebody who, so it's one thing, like the Luce, the people in the in Luce shop, you can go to them and say, I want, I want this, and yeah, they'll make it for you if you tell them exactly what, what you want. But for somebody to come and say, I don't know what I need, what do you have to fix me? You know, they can't do that because they don't know. Okay, we're back, and uh, yeah. So when you when you talk to me at first, you said I'm known as a chinrest maker. Well, I, you know, some people just know me as a violinist, and like people really like to comp compartmentalize, and some people know me only as a violist. You know, and some people yeah. as a violin maker and said, oh, you make bows too, you know. Oh, you make chinres, yeah. you make the whole thing, you know. So it's, but people like to just grab one thing and that's all they're, they think you only do one thing. But, um, but at the same time, in order for me to do this work, I have to know so much stuff. So over the years, and, and one of my loves is, is like connecting all things together because I think everything is actually connected. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like a huge wheel with spokes all radiating out. So in order for me to deal with people's problems, I have to know how they play. I have to know how anyone plays. I have to know what the right way to play. So I've, I've developed my own pedagogy as well, and I've looked at a lot of pedagogy, and, and I gotta tell you, I don't think there's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of, uh, yeah. a lot of misconceptions. Uh, I have some personal bugaboos about things that I keep seeing cropping up all the time, which I know, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of maybe work, but they don't. They don't work for the right reasons. Uh, I know that some of them are going to be problematic for my future clients. They say, if you do that, I'm going to see you in a couple of years. You know, and uh, so, yeah, I I, uh, I have you know a lot to say about the way the violin is taught, and not just from the technical perspective. At the same time, you know, I I, I have kids. You know. And I want them to learn music. So how do I teach little kids, you know, one, to be interested in music, you know, motivated, you know, and to, you know, pick it up and play? And how do you teach them? How do you, how do, you do that sort of thing? You know, so um, I, I love to teach. I've been teaching since I was 12 years old. And I teach anybody. And I, I, I like to teach adults as well. You know, people who are, you know, 50, 60, 70. I had a 96-year-old student once. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I like to, I take lost causes too people that uh, have tried so many teachers and nothing worked. I said, you come to me and I'll teach you how to play, you know? And what do you want to play? Do you want to play Irish music? Do you want to play, uh, you know, klezmer music? Do you want to play classical, Baroque? I had one guy that just wanted to play scales. That's all he did. He didn't want any music. He just wanted scales. I said, okay, <laughs> we'll do scales. You know? I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not saying you got to play this because it's all music is it's like Duke Ellington said, there's only two types of music. There's the good music and the other kind, you know, <laughs> whatever that is, it doesn't matter, you know, and so you don't, you don't classify it uh, that way. I, I, I play everything and you know, I just played the jazz fest uh, two nights ago, you know. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask because you play some jazz and blues. So with your scale student, did you teach jazz scales? If they, if they want to time. learn that, I will, you know, I have, I have yeah. one student that just wants to learn Irish tunes written by Caroline, you know, it was like really isolated, you know, and, and it's okay, fine, we'll, we'll do it with that, you know, and uh, I try to, you know, broaden them out a bit, you know, but uh, I'm not going to force anybody to play something they don't, they don't want, you know, so, uh, yeah, so I, that's, I love the variety, and I think that, I think that you can sort of have fun and, and nail it on any style you want, you know, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't really matter, it's whatever you want, it's whatever's going to motivate you, what's whatever is going to turn your crank, so to speak, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I started improvising when I was a kid, you know, but I'd, I'd improvise in the classical form, you know, I'd, I'd sort of play like my own Paganini things, you know, in that sort of style. Yeah. And, then, and then I loved uh, fiddling tunes, you know, so I'd, I'd uh, search around for some good old East Coast fiddling stuff. It was hard to get hold of information back then. And um, 
and then I heard some, you know, Grappelli jazz and said, wow, what is this, you know, how do you start with that, you know, and so it was just, it was slow going at first, but over the years I, I managed to creep myself in and out of little things, I, I liked Eastern uh, European folk music, I, I played for mm -hmm. 10 years in a Polish folk ensemble, and, um, and I, uh, I played uh, another five years. I was in a klezmer hip hop band, you know, which was uh, Raoul, which was fun because it was it was a really fusion between uh, the klezmer mm -hmm. style. But uh, we had a DJ and everything, and uh, and, tuka -tuka -tuka -tuka, and everything it was it was quite fun. And uh, and I played a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Jewish weddings with a with a band specializing in Jewish weddings, Hasidic weddings. So we learned a lot of the Chabad uh, tunes. And stuff like that, and then you play Italian weddings and everything. So you learn all the all the gypsy music for your Hungarian and Romanian weddings. You know, it's, that was fun. And uh, and I had a friend who was a blues guitarist, so he and I would get together and put on a few shows, playing some some blues. You know, blues with guitar mm -hmm. and violin. At that point, I also started playing washboard. You know, yeah. Okay. So uh, doing some some rhythm work, and uh, and playing mandolin as well. So. It was, it was just fun to do that and a bit of tin whistle, so uh, whatever, whatever, whatever was fun. It was, uh, it was good, to, yeah. good to go. Yeah. I have lots of notes on your on your uh, performing career. I was interested to see all the different groups you've been a part of. Um, you were also a founding member of Imuzi. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I, I imagine uh, Yuli Tarovsky was a, quite a mentor for you. I met him first when he came uh, when he came to Canada. He was uh, he got a job mm -hmm. teaching chamber music at the. Uh, at the conservatoire and uh, I was there at the time and I, I took chamber music and I, I took it with him mm -hmm. and that was fun it was it was fun because he uh, he was very uh, he had a way of um, making you play with uh, I wouldn't say breaking the rules it was more like uh, getting involved with with what mm -hmm. you were doing and uh, so maybe a, a less stiff unconventional approach mm -hmm. You know, a little more wide open, you know, and and very encouraging. You know, I uh, I remember I I was playing viola for like two weeks, uh, at that time at the conservatoire. I just started the conservatoire, and uh, there was a quartet that was playing a Beethoven string quartet, and the violist got injured, and they they didn't they didn't have that many violists in those days. So he he, he says, Peter, do you play viola? I say, uh, well, I just started. You you can play. You can play. You know, so he was very encouraging. He said, so he threw me into this Beethoven string quartet. And, uh, you know, it's just that in sort of encouragement and confidence that, you know, yeah, go ahead, do it. You can do it, you know, and that was great. And uh, so I, I did a few, um, I did quite a bit of uh, interesting chamber music with him over the couple of years. And then uh, when he was interested, I mean, Imuzichi was formed in his mind years before it was actually formed, you know. Mm -hmm. So he had this plan going. And uh, he wanted to get young students, you know, involved. Maybe because we were more malleable, I suppose, you know, to, to the ideas. But nonetheless, uh, he, I think he uh, was um, a big proponent of enthusiasm. You know, you didn't have to be young, but youth very often had enthusiasm, you know, and willingness to, to get involved, and that sort of thing. So um it actually started off with a project with uh, radio canada to record the 12 handel concerto grossi it wasn't mm -hmm. musici at that point it was just a pickup orchestra you know but he he uh put the word out and he called me up and he said yeah i'll do the, do the gig and the next recording you know so we had a lot of fun and it formed at that point and then i think that was uh the tipping point for him he said yeah i think i can do this you know and then he said why don't we make an orchestra you know so it's uh, that's how it started. So and then it, there was of course no money, so we all had to pitch in with all sorts of all sorts of jobs and stuff like that. And eventually, I ended up being the librarian, and I did arrangements for the orchestra. I was uh, stage assistant, stage manager, assistant tour director, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I drove the van, etc. You know, so <laughs> I had a lot of jobs to do uh, do there until uh, until I left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you studied with um, Arthur Garamy at the That's right, yeah. So I, I was looking to find a recording of him, and I found the, on YouTube there's this um, Violet Archer violin concerto he recorded. Mm -hmm. And so you can hear what an amazing violin player he was. What was he like as a teacher? Arthur Garamy was a, a, a wonderful 
wonderful play, uh, person. He uh, he came from Hungary, and uh, so he was a bit like the old school, let's say. And his he wasn't he had a he had a blistering technique in, in, in some ways, but it wasn't the most prominent aspect of uh, of what he did. It was very musical, and he worked very hard at what he did. His his parts were quite marked up in sometimes in different colors, you know, red and blue, you know, and he spent a lot of time changing fingerings and bowings and stuff like that. And um, from a technical perspective, I didn't, he didn't uh, teach you anything about your position or anything like that or how to produce your sound. So he would just sort of gently suggest some ideas, you know, and, uh, and mostly from a musical perspective. And that's sort of what I, I, I think with me, he felt that I was doing okay technically, and I was teaching myself how to play technically mm -hmm. and get by, uh, which I, I, I wasn't such a good teacher at that point for myself. I was missing a few things, uh, but uh, musically, I, I stuck it out with him, and, uh, and it was very rewarding, especially he played a lot. He had the classical court at Montreal, and every year he'd be putting a couple of recitals on in Montreal, and just to go hear him play and, and watch him perform, that was really good. Uh, my viola teacher at the conservatoire ended up being uh, Gerald Stanick, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was also very helpful to me. You know, he'd say, "Peter, how you can bowl like that?" You know, it's so like, "Whoops, what am I doing wrong?" You know, and he says, mm -hmm. "No, nah, you got to change that. You got to change that." You know, and it says, uh, and so he sort of opened my eyes to something that you know I wasn't quite right with my setup, and, and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, uh, it was like a bit of a, a jolt, you know. Also, at that point, I'd been with Arthur Garamy, you know, since I was a teenager. Um, and I got to admit, uh, I wasn't planning to necessarily be a violinist anyway, you know. So mm. I maybe wasn't taking it that seriously, let's say, at that point. But by the time, six years later, uh, with Gerald Stanick, I was, you know, I was thinking, maybe I might make a career out of this. Who knows? We'll see, you know. So it mm -hmm. started to percolate a bit more that maybe I should actually start practicing. <laughs> some or, or clean up a few things if I if I want to get mm -hmm. something done, you know. So that was my uh, part of my incentive to to leave the conservatoire and go to McGill. So you had mentioned that you um, have been improvising since you were young, and I know you play many different styles. Would you be? I, I'd love to hear maybe some of your um, the the uh, klezmer style music you play or Celtic or anything you'd, you'd be up for for showing us. It'd be really fun. Yeah, you know, and like. Mm -hmm. I like improvising and uh, in the different styles, and I, I got to say, I think everybody should do it, mm -hmm. you know, and the, I think everybody should do it just to understand better what it is they're actually doing, what, what are they playing, because we always say, you got to make the music your own, you know, what does that mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I think if people understand from a compositional point of view as well, you know, the composer writes something, and where do they get the idea? And and what is the function of whatever that they're writing? You know, is this is this supposed to sound like you know uh, an ornament or or what? You know, mm -hmm. so if we if we're if we're gonna play you know some baroque music, you've done baroque performance practice, so you know this. You play a sonata, especially in the Italian tradition. You know, uh, you. you uh, uh, bit of Corelli or something like that and then and the repeat there's always a repeat you do the ornaments right well that's like it's an improvisation in a sense you're making up uh, something to go along with the harmonic structure and the uh, general flow so it's very important that you understand when a composer is doing that you know and if you look at the Bach solo sonatas, you know, he's written out the improvisation, you know. So it's very important to, let's say, deconstruct that or at least take a lot of pieces and look at the fundamental and see where the ornament goes and then take the ornaments off, maybe put in some different ornaments like that and just to understand how to play from a performance perspective. If I'm going to go... Sorry, water... I 
I've missed the point. You know, yeah, I played the notes and I played them in roughly in tempo, the way it was. But that's not the point of the improvisation, which he wrote out. You know, you understand that. So it's a and it's a note. If you're on a harpsichord, maybe you'd, you know, on the first chord you do that. The, then. So now you're thinking, okay, I, it's it has to be like a filigree, you know. So so you practice like that. You do all sorts of interesting baroque ornamentation when you're when you're just fooling around, you know. And that's going to help inform your your performance of all the works, you know. And Mozart, you know, the little trills and stuff like that, you know. I love so gypsy music. I said the Eastern European, right? So. Uh, Okay, famous uh, Hungarian tune. Okay, Asotep. So you, you look at the other. Uh, uh, a nice Hungarian tune written by an Italian, right? You can fool around with it. anything you want with those things but then I then I got to thinking well yeah we can do stuff like that but what, what about Mozart and Beethoven these guys and and Telemann and Bach because Bach he's done the improv they would go to the cafes they would have heard these gypsies too right and they'd, they'd take some of this stuff and they'd, they'd put it in their music you know so I then what you do is you take these pieces of music and you uh, you, you change them you know, you, you just think of them. So, if you take the uh, charters, I'll give you another tune here. You might know this one. that tune I'll play it straight the way it was composed Mozart, Sinfonia Concertante. Second movement. It's it's like a gypsy tune, right? I played the second time was what he wrote, but it still sounds like a gypsy tune, right? So you're thinking, well, if I play this like straight note for note, it might be maybe not what he had in mind. Where did he get it from? Who's the chap that he you know took that tune off of? you know, more or less. So when I play this, you know, I'm thinking, okay, let's put a little bit of paprika in there, you know, a little flavor, you know. So that's that's the thing. So that's my approach to classical music as well, improvise on those things, you know. You don't have to think jazz is the only thing you're going to improvise, you know, and you're going to play your jazz and stuff like that, you know. So I've taken it even further back, you know, Telemann, uh, used to be a uh, he wrote a lot of folk music 
you know, or folk inspired, especially Polish Polish uh, folk music, you know. And y if you start playing Telemann with uh, those ideas in mind, you know, you can you can really have some fun with it, you know. And I mean, having fun is is really what it's about. I I, I try to tell my students, you know, don't be don't be super strict about this, you know, uh, especially Boeing's. Boeings I find to be very creative and also I give people a lot of license with Boeings because especially like Baroque to modern bow it's not the same bow you can't do the same thing one hall to another hall change your Boeings you know I, I don't care um, if uh, you know if it if it's not written like that the composer is not around they probably agree with you now you know so uh, you know like I would take like uh, And then I, I put in now who's going to shoot me? Where are the Boeing police going to show up at my door and put me in jail? You know, but what I've done is I've had a bit of fun with it, you know, and so when I get another piece, I have this creative bit to myself you know that I can I can do that you know um, uh, the, the gypsy thing is uh, is uh, I, like to, I like to look at some of the Bach for instance we go back to the uh, spin on it you know turn into something a little bit different you look at Bach uh, the great jazz artists uh, Lucier they've they've all done some sort of version of jazzing up Bach a bit you know it's kind of easy to do especially with those great bass lines but uh, you can uh, you know you can take any you can take the Bach and, and turn it into any, any style you want you know so that's it's always fun um, Klezmer is interesting um, it's not so much ornamentated, like uh, as you probably know. Uh, it's more reaching different levels. You know, there's more like this. It's like uh, Italian Baroque is a lot of notes. French Baroque, not the notes. It's, it's the ornaments. There's a whole collection of ornaments that you can do and passing notes and stuff like that. And so, klezmer ornamentation would would fall more into that category. Let's say, you know, so you have your chirps. And then inflections. When you do the doina, the slow movements, which is uh, doina is like a Romanian. Uh, uh. So it's uh, a lot of colorations and the, the uh, suspension and the, the, the tensions that you got to raise and, and you you want to raise it to another level you go up an octave and stuff like that so it's it's a different approach to uh, to the uh, ornamentation and improvisation it's, it's a lot of fun learning these different styles the same thing if you learn Irish folk or Scottish or and then you do Cape Breton uh, Texas swing you know uh, bluegrass you know it's uh, I, I like to, starting with students, I like to, to, right off the bat, you know, hit them with uh, uh, creative options, you know, to, to, to go with. I, I, I recently um, uh, was coaching some students in a high school, and some of them have been playing for like a year, and some for two years maybe, so really not very high level at all. And um, 
so we're playing like a very simple baroque tune but i wanted to do something else so i i wrote out just a 12 bar blues you know and it's just it's just really simple like <laughs> Four, four, four chords, four notes, whatever. But we had a lead into that, and what I did was, because they were, they couldn't play very much. Uh, I had them do uh, starting off with air sounds, very flotando. Okay, this is to teach them, because whenever you play the instrument, you have to know uh, what the extremes are, left, right, up, down, how far before you end up off the Helmholtz resonance, you know, type of thing. So you're gonna get like a. Your song grand, which is a result of too little bow speed and too much pressure at a specific uh, sounding point, you know, and you go off in the other direction. So you have to go to this, these boundaries before you know where where they are, so you can get that middle ground and get where you want. So I started off with this 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 notes like this, then sliding harmonics, get their hands sliding up. It's it just making sound effects, and then we move from that into. Seagull sounds, you know, then hitting and stuff like that, and and slowly we just move to that, and then boom into the blues type of thing, you know. So these are kids who've been playing one year, but right off the bat, something creative, you know, and you know, you just point them, okay, play, 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 no notes, just make sounds, you know. So uh, and even with you know, if somebody's playing a simple tune, you know, um, Danny Boy or something like that, you know, I say, okay, now you got the notes, let's 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 try and change it up a bit you know let's have some bow speed uh, changes and see what that does you know and let's get some something musical going you know it's I always want to right off the bat you play two notes let's make it musical you know so that's uh, that's where I head you know. I remember when I went to your house those times to for the whole chin rest thing it struck me because your children are a little bit older than mine so I was pretty new mother and I was very inspired because you had children's art all over your house, just all the walls, from floor to ceiling, just celebrating the creativity. It was so beautiful uh, to see. It really stayed with me. Great, yeah, yeah. I know these. I have, I have on the walls here. I, I can't show you. They have copies of uh, the, the group of seven paintings that they did. You know, and uh, and yeah, and uh, there I have here. This is compositions uh, of your son. Yeah, it's it's like all over the place. And it's just ready to go. This is a yeah. a, t a tandem suite for. Uh, for violin viola that he played recently, which was recently performed at National Youth Orchestra by uh, uh, a couple of the staff there, the mm -hmm. faculty. It was a brilliant performance that they did. It was wonderful, you know. So it's, it's yeah, no, it's uh, just it's all over the place. Just let it go, let it go, you know. Yeah, you got to help them along. You got to help them along. It's this is, um, you know, it's uh, if you ha to teach properly, you know, is not easy, you know. And, you know, what I tell all new parents, I say, you know, you're going to be your, your child's teacher whether you like it or not, mm -hmm. you know. So um, if you want to teach your child discipline, you have to show them discipline. You show them that you're disciplined, not tell them how to be disciplined. You have to show them what discipline means. And then they'll learn that. They'll see that, you know. So if, if you want to, you know, if you want to teach them acceptance, you have to show them acceptance. If you want to teach your creativity, you have to show them creativity, you have to give them the opportunity, you know, and it doesn't have to be over the head. I never really taught my, my son a lesson on the violin, you know, we just played together, you know, and to me that was the, the best way to do it, and it, it's oddly enough, it's like the, what Suzuki, mm -hmm. the, the, the foundation of his teaching was like, like teaching a language, just yeah. immersion, immersion, so it was just, you know, yeah, let's just play. And yeah, you correct a little thing here and there. You know, this is you, know, just, you might might like it better if you do it this way. Here, try that. Or, and then, but just have fun. You know, and then slowly, you know, if they take to it, they take to it. You know, and uh, but enjoy it with them. And and if you make an enjoyable experience, better chance that they'll they might not make a career out of it, but they'll stick with it longer. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know they might make a career and they'll enjoy it then. You know, because you've taught them the enjoyment of it, and. Um, all those little hesitations, they, 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 they stop your creativity. I'm not saying my parents stop my creativity. I'm just saying, in general, if you want your, your kids to, to be creative, you know, just give them time to do their thing, you know, and uh, it's, uh, it's very important. 
Part two of this conversation continues next episode with a lot of specifics about playing and teaching the violin, some of Peter's innovative instrument designs, his unique shoulder support, and some great wisdom. My life is so enriched by getting to know these incredibly inspiring creative guests and their perspectives on their lives and music. Please follow this podcast and sign up for my podcast newsletter to get sneak peeks for upcoming guests and find out about newly published transcripts.